What is learning? Learning, by the definition from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is the acquisition of skills, knowledge, and understanding through study, instruction, or experience. Um, however, underlying to that definition is the fact that somebody else has to experience or record or teach that action or experience prior to the subject gaining this new knowledge. Learning from others is really central to our growing and evolving society. So let's dive in a little bit deeper on what this looks like. My name is Erin Healy. This is my personal philosophy statement for EPSY 5510. How do we as humans learn? Well, to quote one of my favorite holiday movies, Love is All Around Me, in this case, learning is all around everybody. There are so many different theories of how people learn, if it's instinctive action as a result of nature, or if it's you know a result of behaviors brought on through nurturing. Are our environments and personal backgrounds conditioning us to act in distinctive ways? I believe that modeling and imitation are the most consistent methods of learning for all people. In this way, the lived experiences and recorded knowledge of each person influence the future behaviors of others. In my personal background as a high school English teacher, I recognize the importance of this social form of learning and work to enhance collaboration and communication skills in all of my classes as kind of the central theme of my practice. My students are learning from me and from their peers, as well as the authors and the texts that we are studying and all of the experiences and engagement that they're brought in through, especially in distance learning, through um, you know videos and rec and Skypes and, and Zoom calls with others and bridging outside of their community. Their minds are soaking up every interaction, every single sentence, each fluctuation in body language, obviously a lot easier when we didn't have to wear masks, uh, and they're acting in ways that reflect this social dynamic. Uh, I believe that the social learning theory is the best theory to describe this type of learning that I have seen as the most common and most effective method in all of my classes. So the social learning or social cognitive learning theory relies on a couple basic assumptions. So first, it is that people can learn by observing others' behavior and the consequences that result. Growing up, I watched my parents work four different jobs between them, and that was to work to put a roof over our heads, food on our plates, and hopefully, you know, send us off to, to college, but while still paying off their thousands of dollars of higher education loans. I saw that the work ethic that resulted from that passion and and necessity, obviously, uh, and I learned how to take careful risks and really prioritize effectively how to persist and persevere through through most challenges most challenges, and how important that field of education was to everybody's future successes. Now, as a teacher, I can see my students observing me, and I'm really working to try and portray a certain image to them through my behavior and interactions, in addition to teaching my content area. It's equally important to me to demonstrate the power of respect and humility while making sure they never ever leave my class using personal pronouns in a formal essay. The darker side of this, of course, can be seen in Albert Bandura and Richard Walter's study of aggression in adolescent boys from advantaged homes. In this case study, they were allowed to act, they were not allowed to act out in the home, but they were expected to be tough in school. They'd watch their parents aggressively at, take their side in school disagreements and the successful result for the boys, in any case, of that aggression. This cycle of hostility would continue outside of the home because the influence of their parents' public modeling was honestly more stronger than any potential consequence from the boys' aggression. Media, including movies and video games, can have a similar impact of this modeling. Bender reported in a 1986 interview that, quote, the sight of superheroes on the screen, killing indiscriminately and with great satisfaction, provides sanctions for others to model such actions. Our images of reality are warped, end quote. Understanding this power of our influence and imitation needs to permeate every aspect of our lives, especially as educators. But we will always see will we always see the direct results of this modeling? That's where the second tenet of social learning theory comes into play. Learning can occur without a change of behavior. This pillar of the social learning theory is what makes it so different from the behaviorist learning theory. Behaviorists are focused on that initiation of a behavior change. They believe that the learning is evident when the behaviors of the learner change in some way. 
Take Ivan Pavlov's famous experiment, for example. He was able to pair a stimulus with a conditioned response, so in this case, the sound of a bell with the arrival of food, to teach the dog to salivate at the sound of the bell with or without the food. The emphasis on this research was on that behavior change, the arrival of saliva with the new sound. However, social learning theory proves that knowledge can be acquired without a change of behavior. In fact, most behaviors are a result of observing an action, storing the memory, and imitating that action on a later date. This delayed reaction to learning was demonstrated through my experience in the teacher preparatory program at my undergraduate university. I was expected to learn through observation in my student practices or practicums and then act on that knowledge later when I took over the classroom for the first time as a student teacher. When I did take over the classroom, my use of generic, older, accepted curriculum materials was encouraged. That was the best way for it to ease your way into the position, I was told. Um, it's common ground amongst your colleagues and it works, right? However, I really wanted to stand out and ask my principal for a, an an awesome letter of recommendation. He was my high school principal when I was in high school and transitioned when I was becoming a teacher. And he, you know, was a mentor of mine. So I really wanted to stand out in a way that would get that great letter of recommendation from a respected mentor. So I decided to experiment with some out of the box lesson ideas and, and some, some new plans. This behavior is not necessarily positively reinforced beforehand in any way by my environment. I think I took a lot of people by surprise, actually. Uh, rather, the expectation of future reinforcement and incentive influenced the learning of the behavior it preceded. In this case, I hope that if I did a good enough job and stood out, I would get an awesome letter of recommendation from my mentor that I admired. This ties directly into the third tenet of social learning theory. Cognition plays an important role in learning. Because I can anticipate a result to an action, even if I've never performed that action before, or I, I can describe the result based on memory, I have learned something. That demonstrates I've learned it also without doing it. I have watched people perform trumpet solos, for example, without emptying their spit valve or tuning to their piano accompanist. And I can describe the auditory pain that that inflicts in my brain, but I've never repeated these actions when I personally have performed. I can also anticipate responses based on past modeling and act accordingly. For example, if I'm performing a piece on the trumpet and solo and I expect a round of applause and don't get one, I've learned something. Uh, that, that neural learning has been negatively enforced, but I've learned something here. And that is a result of my actions and not necessarily my environment. Finally, the fourth tenant is the simple fact that humans have personal agency. While behaviorism focuses on the environment's effect on the learning and the learner and behavior, social learning theory reminds us that humans have control over their actions and their setting. They are not held by the whims of their surroundings and they can make changes on where they are, who they're with, and what they're doing. For example, in Rhode Island where I teach, secondary high school age students have the opportunity to attend pretty much any high school they want to, if they enroll in a career in tech pathway that's not offered in their own district. Students are choosing for ideally academic purposes to change the trajectory of their learning pathway for something or someone that's a better fit for them. My high school that I teach at currently is one of the first career in tech high schools in our state, and we offer a large variety of career in tech programs from cosmetology to marine tech to culinary to performing arts. We teach students from all over the southern half, half of Rhode Island and sometimes even further who have chosen to come to this new learning environment because that's the best fit for them. That agency, that's the first step in them taking ownership in their learning. This leads me into my classroom. I think that the, in teaching with the social learning theory, teachers must emphasize these important and unique experiences of every single student in their class and, and let their students teach each other. They need to present in my content area, diverse texts that represent all the voices in their broader community. And teachers must always strategically model the skills and the mindset they wish to develop in their students. It's critical to allow them to demonstrate their personal mastery of, your, of the content in a way that places students' strengths, no matter what they might be, if they're inside or outside of your content area. By providing options to encourage ownership, students will step up to the plate because it's something they have a say in and responsibility over and a passion for. So I personally believe that project-based learning is the best form of teaching to approach this complex subject and, and really succeed in this learning theory. 
I think that it's the best way to create opportunities for personalization in the class and set the stage for some dynamic social engagement and interactions. Students are learning in a hands-on format, utilizing resources from mentors and, and experts that they can actively see engaging in the work in the real world and observe their peers also in action. Their individualized and active problem solving opens up a pathway to utilizing this retained learning from past observation and experience and provides a platform by which their peers can also then learn from them. Outside of all these benefits of utilizing social learning theory, project-based learning is also a stepping stone for students to practice skills they'll need in the workforce at a younger age and in a supportive environment while setting up anticipations and expectations which they will continue learning from in the future. One of my favorite project-based learning units with my students is based around this nonfiction account of marginalized members of the United States Armed Forces. Our theme in ninth grade English at my school is the hero's journey. And in this unit, we look to see what it takes to be an American hero. We study the first female prisoners of war, the angels of Bataan and Corregidor. We look at the Japanese American and African Americans who served their country loyally despite racial conflicts at home. And we also study the Navajo Native Americans who created a code by which America really won the war, but were not able to be recognized for their service for decades after the war. After reading the informational text, we examine how people are memorialized in our culture and in our history, and we look at different tributes to people who have been heroes in our society. We read excerpts of the novel Code Talkers by Joseph Bruchak to see how individual, uh, individuals can collect memories and turn them into narratives to share and, and boost and elevate these stories on a public platform. We also peruse online museum collections of the, photograph uh, the photography of Susimo Itu and has photo collection of World War II. The students are then tasked with creating some sort of memorial to one individual in any of these four communities we studied. We, they perform independent research or they can work with a partner and they create some sort of product or a model of the product, I'll, I'll show that in a bit, that, that they are of their representation, of their, of their memorial. So in this case, this drawing is of a student who wanted to create a sculpture of a plane to, to um, celebrate the Tuskegee Airmen. And then he was going to put that sculpture of a plane, which he actually created in clay in our art room in the, in the kiln. And he, he, he had that as his demonstration and he was going to put that sculpture um, on the air base. Um, the students then get to work with these projects and invite local veteran organizations to the school and host a luncheon. Uh, their students who have chosen, on the left you can see the food option, they can prepare food as, as, as that memorial and that representation and share it with our local heroes and, and, and hear the stories of our local servicemen while also sharing their own learnings. This is always a highlight of the, of the year um, and students are really able to you know, put their learning into action. This project showcases the student's strength that are outside of the traditional English language arts and writing, and it also allows them to teach each other about their independent research. Honor and respect are modeled at all times and demonstrated in this event. And also, they're studying really high academic content on their own, which is, you know, again, promoting that self-direction and that ownership that's so critical to social learning. Now, I would love to assess this assignment on uh, my preferred form of assessment, which is uh, student-centric standard-based grading. Uh, but however, my department is uses specific standardized rubrics for all of our formal assessments, and we call them you know, portfolio-worthy essays. However, our foreign language department at Cherahoe has adapted these rubrics to start exploring more student-centric, reflective performance rubrics. And uh, one of my colleagues kind of told to let me take some of the aspects of these rubrics and incorporate more informal check-ins in my own class, which I will get into. These mastery rubrics allow for students to improve over time in certain skills and track their progress over several assessments. I actually taught this on the Summit platform for learning at my first job at a charter school, and I thought that the, the idea of seeing progress in action was incredibly valuable for these students. They can you know, try and try all over again and, and watch as they begin to excel in areas that they, they really struggle and see the difference that hard work, dedication, and perseverance makes. Um, it also really 
relies on that modeling because when you have a student that comes in and, and already has mastered some of these skills, they can teach the rest of the class and build that community through the different levels of expertise. Students might come into any class, right, in September with with excellent past experiences, especially at Cheriho, we see students coming from different school districts and we don't really know what they what they know in our content area. And, and we can watch them support their peers and really thrive in this environment. What I also like about these rubrics is that on the right hand side, you can see how they provide for student self reflection. Uh, this makes sure that they're observing, experiencing and translating memory into future use in a written format that that teachers can see. And also, you know, when they practice multiple times, they can go back and reflect on that journey in a way that really solidifies that that knowledge. So how I incorporate this in kind of an informal way is through uh, qualitative data assess assessments and check ins in some of my long longer projects that work towards that final product that has to be reviewed by my department rubrics. I use um, what's called the grid method. It is a process developed by the master learning company out in Indiana, and they created a grid based on the Bloom's taxonomy rubric that you see here, this pyramid. Essentially, it scaffolds the learning as it levels up the Bloom's taxonomy, and it challenges students to have an option to go above and beyond in your subject area. So you can see this is my mastery grid for my Odyssey narrative piece. So it breaks the skills down and students can really see what areas they need to work on. The self-reflection check at the end before they level up to level two really solidifies those skills. And what I really like is that the qualitative data from the formative assessments on this grid, and this is what the students see, by the way, with the levels right here, and then they have a tracker so they can you know, pinpoint where they are and, and what skills they're hitting. Uh, it really allows me to pinpoint based on you know the tracker and, and the grid set up what skills I need to be emphasizing in future units that students are spending a little bit longer on or they have a lot more questions on um, and what skills that they're really excelling in and I can promote those skills in future lessons. My grades between when I taught this essay without a grid and then with a grid were also a lot higher with the grid because students had the ability to stop at each step and recognize which individual skills they need to work on and perfect those before they moved on in the paper and turned in a product that they were really, really proud of. This is just to show, again, how important it is to take that student voice, student choice, and student ownership into consideration in all of our classes, but in also you know, the rest of our lives. These skills just go to show, again, how every student learns differently. Every student learns differently because all students are human and they need a style of teaching that reflects these unique challenges, diverse strengths, and amazing stories that come into our classroom every single day. They need to learn in a way that translates our content knowledge and our life knowledge outside of the classroom space and continues on for the rest of their life. They need role models to show them what's possible and I believe that the social learning theory will teach them how to do that. Thank you so much. These are my references. I can move my head. And I will attach this slide deck to the submission. Thank you very much.